डोंट बी पुस्ड अराउंड बाई फियर्स इन योर माइंड बट बी लेड बाई द ड्रीम्स इन योर हार्ट वट इज द फ्यर ऑफ द फ्यर ऑफ दर्टिनिटी दैट दिस कोविड हैज ब्रॉट इन टू आर लाइफ yes it is the first time that all of us all over the world because of covid are facing so many uncertainties but if you think of it when was life certain when was there no uncertainty in the life never even the smallest of the thing that we think we are very very sure of turns out to be the opposite and the only thing that we can be certain of the only thing that we have in our hands right now which will turn out to be exactly how we want it to be the only thing that nobody can take away from us is today is this time now and the only only one thing that is going to stay with you always for life even if everybody else leaves you is you and you believe in yourself so if you believe in yourself if you believe in your dreams and if you use this today this now to the fullest no matter how uncertain the future is you can always you will always be able to find out a way you will always turn out any uncertainty into an opportunity so let us turn any uncertainty into an opportunity by utilizing this precious moment that we have in our hands in the best fullest way possible so with that note let us start with the uh, ent questions of the nicet yes um, uh, most of them were the repeat questions so what we are going to do is not only those questions which were asked but also what are the other uh, questions of the same topic which are very important and which have been asked repeatedly in the last few years so let us start with the first question Yes so the first question we have here is all the following are features of complications of chronic otitis media except so the complications of chronic otitis media is asked so yes i want to ask you that these complications that have been mentioned here we will read that out a little later can you tell me that these will be the complications the complications of chronic otitis media only or of acute otitis media also yes the complications can be of acute also how in acute and how in chronic yes they are much much more common in chronic otitis media because there we have yes the bony eroding property bony eroding property of what yes of cholesteatoma whereas in acute otitis media how do these complications occur we do not have any cholesteatoma any bone erosion in acute otitis media yes because of the infection going through natural pathways the natural openings the congenital dehiscence or the dehiscence that has been created by surgery or very commonly by hematogenous spread so yes what are the things that we need to know the very important things which are repeatedly asked in complications of the chronic otitis media or acute otitis media yes we need, we know that the complications can be either limited to the temporal bone that is limited to the ear that is known as intratemporal and when it goes out of the temporal bone intracranially that is what is known as intracranial complications so here in the intratemporal when it is limited to the ear yes when in the middle ear we can have yes the very important nerve palsy the facial nerve palsy now when from the middle ear it goes into the inner ear from the middle ear it goes into the inner ear yes what is that complication very good labyrinthitis so now you are going to answer this question can a patient of labyrinthitis develop meningitis because of labyrinthitis yes this is a repeated question that is asked yes or no labyrinthitis can lead to meningitis and yes meningitis can lead to labyrinthitis yes so uh, through through what what is the communication through which a labyrinthitis can become meningitis the repeated question yes yes through either through cochlear aqueduct or through internal acoustic meatus so if there is labyrinthitis also then what will happen there will be additional vertigo in the patient okay so if the infection from the middle ear goes posteriorly what do we have posteriorly yes we have the mastoid so here in the mastoid we have multiple air cells and what will happen is that all the mastoid air cells will get inflamed will get filled with pus what is that complication known as yes that is what is mastoiditis so now look at this picture yes uh, what is the spot diagnosis Yes what we can see here is that the mastoid here is inflamed it is edematous it is congested yes this is the typical appearance uh, how it will appear on the external when inside in the mastoid there is lot of inflammation all the mastoid air cells are filled with uh, pus and they are badly inflamed so that will give the mastoid area the post auricular area very smooth appearance that is what is known as can you quickly tell me yes that is the ironed out mastoid we have done all this in great detail we are just quickly revising the important points that are asked repeatedly in the exam yes 
Yeah, so that is the ironed out mastoid. And this uh, pus in the mastoid air cells can coalesce and it can rupture all around the mastoid. So if it ruptures posteriorly, yes. Yeah, so what is this? There can be a posterior collapses. And if it ruptures uh, at the uh, sternocleular mastoid, the upper border of the sternocleular mastoid, what is that abscess known as? Yes, that is the basalt abscess. If at the posterior body, border of, uh, uh, posterior belly of digastric, then that is known as, yes, sitelly abscess. If the, it ruptures towards the external artery canal, yes, anteriorly we have the external artery canal. So if it ruptures towards the external artery canal, we will be able to see a bulge in the external artery canal, in the uh, posterior wall of external artery canal. So that is what is lux abscess. And, uh, when there is a, uh, a bulge here, we will also, what we will see when, through the external artery canal a sagging of the posterior wall of external artery canal yes the posterior wall of external artery canal that wall is the common wall between the external artery canal anteriorly and the mastoid posteriorly yes and also what will happen is that the pus from the mastoid mastoid will through the auditors go into the middle ear and that pus will present in the external artery canal the moment you clean it it refills with pus you clean it again refills with pus showing that there is a reservoir of pus in the mastoid quickly tell me what is that sign known as Yes, very good. The reservoir sign. Yes, all these things about mastoiditis. Very, very important question. Okay, so now the pus from the, the infection from the mastoid can also go to the petrous part of the temporal bone, the petrous apex, leading to abscess in the petrous apex, that is petrositis. So here, yes, can you tell me the spot diagnosis? What is this? What is this? This is a child who came with the complaint of uh, diplopia, difficulty in vision. Yes, and uh, uh, discharging here. Yes, can you see and tell what is the CT showing? Yes, what is the CT showing here? We can see here this is the master air cells and the master air cells compared with the normal side here. In On the normal side, we can see all air in the master air cells. Here it is all filled with uh, fluid or with pus. And also what we can see is that this infection has also gone up till the petrous apex. Can you see? Yes, here the petrous apex is appearing uh, aerated. Here it is all filled with and uh, this is what is yes petrocytis so can you tell me why this child is having diplopia can you see the picture yes in this picture this patient is not able to see this side so yes which palsy it is because of which palsy lateral rectus so which nerve has got involved here Yes, the sixth nerve. So, can sixth nerve be involved in the petrous apex at the level of the petrous apex? Yes, the sixth nerve goes through here to, uh, uh, through the petrous apex to go anteriorly into the eye. So, this is, uh, involved in petrocytis. Can you tell me any other nerve which is involved in petrocytis? Yes, that is the fifth nerve. So, we have the fifth nerve also here at the Meckel scape. So, we have the fifth and sixth nerve involvement. We have the involvement of the fifth nerve, sixth nerve palsy and along with that persistence of your discharge. And now tell me, what is this triad known as? Very good. That is what is the Gradenigo triad. Gradenigo triad. This is a very, very commonly asked uh, complication of uh, chronic otitis media. Okay, now when the infection from the mastoid erodes the bone posteriorly or through hematogenous, it goes intracranially, that is intracranial complication. So here we have this question, which is the most common intracranial complication of uh, otitis media. Most common intracranial complication. Yes, it is meningitis. Followed by brain abscess. Which brain abscess is seen most commonly? Yes, the temporal lobe abscess. So here we have a 10 year old child who came with a complaint of convulsions and nominal aphasia with chronic otitis media. There is a patient of chronic uh, otitis media along with convulsions and there is nominal aphasia. The CT is showing this picture. Can you tell me the diagnosis? Yes, yes, temporal lobe abscess. So this is the second most compli common complication of uh, chronic otitis media of or of otitis media. And here, what uh, was the question that was asked was not the diagnosis. What was asked was the management. How will you manage this patient? Yes, MRM followed by abscess drainage or abscess drainage followed by MRM. What will you do first? Yes, always the intracranial complication has to be managed first. So it is the abscess drainage followed by MRM. Yes, so now don't think that why the source of infection we are not removing. We are removing the source of infection. We are going for a MRM, but we are uh, managing the intracranial complication first. So when do we do a MRM is not after six months, one year, two years. Yes, just 
once the patient is stable, maybe 48 hours, maybe 5 days, we go for MRM. Okay, so here, um, when the infection from the uh, mastoid goes uh, here, superiorly, we will have the meningitis, we have, will have brain abscess, extradural, subdural abscess, all that is the intracranial complication. Out of which, yes, you told me what was the most common? Is the meningitis. Now, when it erodes the bone posteriorly, what important structure do we have posteriorly? Yes, we have the sigmoid sinus. So, uh, there will be pressure on the sigmoid sinus, damage of the intima of the vessel leading to thrombosis. And that is what is known as sigmoid sinus thrombosis. So, what will happen if there is a thrombus here in the sigmoid sinus? What will happen? Yes, this thrombus will tend to embolize everywhere. If it goes in fairly, Yes, what does the sigmoid sinus continue down in the neck as? Yes, the internal jugular vein. So, it goes into the internal jugular vein. The internal jugular vein gets thrombosed. The internal jugular vein becomes very hard, cord-like. There is severe tenderness in the neck in the area overlying the jugular vein. Now, when this embolus, so this is when it goes down. When it goes down further into the heart, into the systemic circulation, then as the embolus is uh, reaching the systemic circulation, there is a peak of fever. Again, the patient is fine. Again, there is again another release of emboli, infective emboli into the systemic circulation. Again, a peak of fever. Can you tell me what is that peak of fever known as? What is this type of fever known as? Yes, this is known as hectic type of fever or Yes, the, like the fence, the picket fence fever, the picket fence or the hectic type of fever. Now, I'm not writing down anything here because we have already revised and this is a very quick revision for you of the additional things. We have already done all this in quite great detail. And this is just a check whether you remember it, remember all this or not. So, when this embolus goes superiorly, yes, where will it go? Yes, it can go into the, it will go into the tributary of the Sigmoid sinus that brings the mastoid. Do you name, no, can you tell me the name? Yes, this is the mastoid emissary vein. The mastoid emissary vein. And this is responsible for drainage of the mastoid area. Drainage will not happen of the mastoid. So what will happen? There will be edema here in the mastoid. There will be edema. There will be tenderness in this area. So do you know of any other condition where there is edema and tenderness over the mastoid? Yes, when there is inflammation within the mastoid, what is that? Mastoiditis. Also, when there is an obstruction of the venous drainage, venous congestion, because of inflammation, because of thrombus in the mastoid emissary vein, that is also leading to edema of the mastoid. And here it is known as, it is known as Grisinger's sign. Grisinger's sign, that is Grisinger's. That is Grisinger's sign. And yes, this is a very, very important, very commonly asked sign. Lateral sinus thrombosis, in fact, we have so many signs that are seen and all of them are asked in your exam. So, when it goes further, it can go further, embolize it, it can embolize into any of the uh, central venous uh, sinuses. And uh, when we um, do a, a, a CT scan, what CT? Yes, when we want to see the vascularity, we always go for a contrast because we, we put the contrast as IV. So, we will be able to see wherever th there is blood flow, that area will appear enhanced. So, when we go for a contrast enhanced CT, if there is a embolus here, thrombus here, in the, uh, in any of the sinuses, how will, uh, does that appear? Yes. So, the thrombus does not take up the contrast. The walls appear like a triangle. So, this is the typical appearance and this is what is known as the empty triangle. You can see here, this is the area. All this, this is the area of the uh, sinus the sigmoid sinus. So, we can see here, this all is the area of the sigmoid sinus. So, here the thrombus does not take up the contrast. This area appears like, the walls appear like an empty triangle, also known as delta sign. So, that is what is known as the delta sign. And yes, this can be seen either on the CECT or it can be seen on contrast uh, enhanced MRI, that is MRI with gadolinium enhancement. Both will show this appearance of CECT. And yes, another important question here is that uh, if there is Grisinger sign, that is because of, that is because of obstruction of which vein? Of the mastoid emissary vein. And in this patient, one of the jugular vein is blocked. If one of the jugular vein is blocked, we have only one functional jugular vein. So, if we block that functional jugular vein, this is the only normal jugular vein. If we block the normal jugular vein, what will happen? There will be a sudden increase in the CSF pressure when we block that jugular vein. So, that increase in CSF pressure 
uh, we can uh, note, we can test. How can we test it and how will it help us? Yes, normally if you just press your one jugular vein, the CSF pressure does not increase because we have the uh, both of them draining the uh, the uh, intra intracranial, uh, we are the venous drainage of the cranium. Whereas if there is only one functional and if we block that, the other is already blocked. So that will lead to a sudden increase in the CSF pressure. And that if we, uh, if that, if it is present, it shows us that the opposite side is blocked and this is the only functional jugular vein. So how can we note, how can we see, how can we measure that uh, increase in CSF pressure? Yes, so if we block uh, one of the jugular vein, which is the normal, the only functional, the normal jugular vein, that uh, will show us increase in CSF pressure, which we can test either on the lumbar puncture or we can see it as uh, papillary edema. The increase in CSF pressure can be seen as papillary edema in the eye. When we see it in the eye, can you tell me what is that known as? Quickly tell me. Yes, this is your division. Yes. Yes, Crobeck sign. That is Crobeck sign. And if we see it, uh, the increase in uh, CSF pressure in the lumbar puncture, that is what is known as Tobey Iyer. Tobey Iyer or Quickenstead's test. Tobey Iyer or Quickenstead's test. Quickenstead's test. Yes, Tobia error, quick and search. So what we are seeing is there are so many findings in the lateral sinus thrombosis which are as is true or false in your exam. There is jugular vein uh, tenderness, yes or no? Yes. There is edema of the mastoid, what is that known as? Grisinger sign. Tobe IR test, yes. There is uh, uh, Krobeck sign, yes. There is delta sign, yes. Delta sign is seen on CCT or on MRI and that is uh, uh, diagnostic of the thrombus there. So, uh, so many things we are seeing there. Now, just have a look at this picture and can you tell me, is this an inflammation of the mastoid area that you are seeing? Is this mastoiditis or is this the Grisinger sign that you are seeing? No, we cannot confuse this with the inflammatory edema that is seen in mastoiditis. There is no need for any confusion. There is no way we can confuse this is totally appearing like a bruise and yes, this is a bruise and this signifies a base of skull fracture and this is what is known as the battle sign. This battle sign was a question that was asked this year in uh, one of your exams. I think that was Ames. Uh, it was asked, this picture was given and the history of trauma was also given. This is the battle sign because of the uh, contusion of the posterior auricular artery and this is a indicator of the base of skull fracture. Now, this is known as battle sign. Why is it known as battle sign? Because it is seen after battle or uh, no, because Dr. Battle uh, discovered this. And this is not seen immediately after the injury. This is seen after one to two days after injury. So uh, many a times when there is a uh, fracture of the pituitous part of the temporal bone, the GC of the GCS of the patient, the Glasgow comma scale of the patient is normal. The patient is conscious. The patient is cooperative. But uh, if you see this appearance developing after a day or two, it is indicated that the patient has a base of skull fracture and this patient needs to be investigated thoroughly for a base of skull fracture. So this is the very very important sign is yes, not very commonly seen but yes commonly asked in your exams the battle sign so yes we cannot confuse it with this appearance this is the mastoiditis iron dot appearance now this is the tympanic membrane that we are seeing of this patient you tell me this is the tympanic membrane of this patient of a mastoiditis or it is the tympanic membrane of this patient a patient who has had a base of skull fracture a pitous temporal bone fracture yes this is what Yes, what you are seeing here is a totally dark blue tympanic membrane. This is a feature of the uh, pitreous temporal bone fracture, the base of skull fracture and yes, this is the hemotympanic. Whereas in a mastoiditis, what will be the appearance? Yes, the tympanic membrane will appear inflamed or maybe the tympanic membrane is ruptured and what you are seeing is discharge. What sign? Yes, the reservoir sign. So now let us uh, see this question. All the following are features of complications of chronic otitis media. Yes, Delta sign, yes or no? Delta sign is seen in. Yes, the lateral sinus thrombosis. Grisinger sign. Yes, again, lateral sinus thrombosis. Battle sign. No, that is not. And basal abscess. Yes, basal abscess is a feature of of mastoiditis. In which muscle? Yes, in sternocleidomastoid. So the answer is A, B, and D. Where do we have A, B, and D? Yes. So this is the answer here. So here we have another question. The radiograph uh, shown below is done for the better assessment of frontal sinus. So the answer itself they have given here. For the frontal sinus, if you see the radiograph or not, most of the picture-based questions just by seeing uh, the 
question if something is extra is given in the question you can make out what the answer will be so this is for the frontal sinus so what is the common name of this view so yes with all due respect to the x-rays uh, we know now that x-rays nowadays neither are they run for sinusitis neither for conditions of the ear we have got uh, very good imaging nowadays the ct scan so ct scan shows everything so beautifully whether it is the ear or the nose if we are doing for ear the best investigation will be a ct scan when we do we go for investigation uh, the radiological investigation in ear conditions Yes, usually for diagnosis of ear conditions, we go for audiometry. Yes, we go for the various audiometric tests. And when do we like to go for a radiological investigation in ear conditions? Yes, as we just saw that, we, we saw the pitocytis uh, CT scan. Yes, so whenever there is complications of the otitis media that we want to see, where all it has gone, what all it has involved, or when there is fractures of the temporal bone, what all is involved, uh, we want to see where uh, all the fracture is extending to. Then we go for CT. And that is again an important question, which is the best investigation for pitus temporal bone fracture? Which is the best radiological test for chronic otitis media? Is it CT or MRI? Yes, it is CT. With CT? Yes, it is a HRCT. Always remember, for temporal bone, the best CT is high resolution CT, HRCT. And for nose also, for the sinuses, for nasal polyps, for chronic sinusitis, the best radiological investigation is not X-ray, it is CT. With CT here? Yes, the non-contrast CT, NCCT. But yes, uh, the x-rays have been a very favorite question of your exams and I think for the past uh, two, three years, uh, all the, uh, most of the uh, tests are containing the x-rays. So repeatedly, what are the x-rays that are asked in your exam? Yes, one is the this view that is the Cadwell view. What is the Cadwell view? What we have to know in the Cadwell view, it is a occipital frontal view from behind to front. So it is a occipital frontal view occipital frontal view and what are the things that are, we are able to see here in the occipital frontal view yes the frontal sinuses are they appear the best here they are visualized uh, very uh, clearly we can also see along with the frontal sinuses we can also see the anterior ethmoids we can also see the maxillary sinus here yes so this is what we see in the occipital frontal view and also we have this view. What is this? Yes, we, what we saw was the occipital frontal view is a head nose procedure, uh, position. The head and the nose touches the film. And whereas here, this is a, uh, nose and a chin position. This is what is the water's view. The water's view is the occipital mental view. So what we need to know in the oxy, in the water's view is it is occipital mental and how do we remember it? How do we put water like this? Yes. So it is the occipital mental view from up it is coming down, occipital mental view. And how does the x-ray appear? It appears like this. What are the sinuses that we are able to see? Yes, the frontal, the anterior ethmoid here. This thing, can you see? Yes, that is the anterior ethmoid. Yes, we have the maxillary sinus here. Maxillary sinus, we can see it is hazy on one side and on the other side it is appearing normal aerated. So, uh, this is, you can see with closed mouth. The mouth is closed here. The mouth is closed here. We can see the teeth here. So, this is what is water's view. If the same view, occipital mental view. If you see, if we take with the mouth open, then that is what is known as the Peary's view. And this was a question that was asked in your exam again this year. So, what how, what difference will it make if we take with the mouth open? Yes, we are also able to see the sphenoid sinuses. Can you see the sinuses here? Yes, along with the other sinuses, we are also able to see the sphenoid sinus. So here, another question is asked here that in uh, what is view, which sinus is not seen? Yes, so can you tell me which sinus is not seen? Yes, we can see the frontal, the anterior ethmoid, the maxillary, the sphenoid. What is not seen is the posterior ethmoid. So all the sinuses are seen in which view of the x-ray of the paranasal sinuses? Yes, the lateral view. So the, in the lateral view, this is one question asked. The other question that is asked in the lateral view is that uh, in the lateral view x-ray of the paranasal sinuses, which is the paranasal sinus that is seen highest? 
Yes, why it is asked is because you might think that yes, sphenoid. Sphenoid is in the base of skull, so that might be the highest. No, the base of skull is not straight. The base of skull, we can see it goes slanting down. So the highest uh, sinus in the lateral view is the frontal sinus. The frontal is the highest. And uh, again, the other thing that is asked in this view is this was marked and was asked what is this? So what is this area that we are seeing? Yes, this is the sphenoid sinus that we are seeing, and above that is the uh, cella tercica, the pituitary fossa the fossa for the pituitary the seed for pituitary so that is what is asked here and again sphenoid sinus is marked sometime and does what is this sinus here otherwise also what we can see is that yes uh, the rest of the sinuses are appearing so overlapped we are not able to see much things on the x-ray here now uh, the detail about the um, x-ray and the uh, ct scan all the and all the instruments uh, we have done in the uh, in uh, in my youtube channel which is in the name of manisha ent you can go then and you can have a look we have compiled everything together so that it can be a quick revision you can watch it at 2x speed if uh, uh, you have time that will be a very quick revision so what was this answer what was the answer of this question yes the answer is the Cadwell view. This is the Cadwell view. We know now what is Waters view. We know what is Pierre's view. What is re, re, race, race view? This race view is for the optic foramen. This is done by ophthalmologists. We do not do it in ENT. We do not do it here. So coming to the next question. Yes, this is a patient of DNS. Okay, so it is already given that there is DNS here. And yes, this is the endoscopic picture that is uh, given here. Identify the arrow mark structure. So what is marked here? Yes, so the first thing that we need to know is that the structure that is marked is something, some projection that we are seeing. Is it the DNS that we are seeing, the septum that we are seeing or is it some turbinate? Yes, when it is an endoscopic picture of the nose, either we are seeing the lateral wall or we are seeing the septum and we are seeing both of them in the same field. So, how do we know that which one is the septum? which one is the uh, turbinate. If the septum is straight, it becomes easier to identify. But if the septum is deviated, then that is where you confuse. But there is nothing to confuse here. Just see here. Yes, this is the enlarged view of uh, this endoscopic picture. What we can see is that a DNS is always a smooth curve that is of the septum. Can you see? It is a smooth curve of the septum. Whereas a turbinate appears, it is a projection. It is a projection on the wall. So it is never uh, 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 along with the wall and never a smooth curve. It is a curve like this. You can see it is a projection. The, the turbinates are also known as conca. Conca means like a bowl. So it is like a bowl. Yes, so this is one turbinate that we are seeing. This is another turbinate. We can see it is appearing so much like a projection coming from one of the walls. So yes, which wall will that be? That is the lateral wall. So when we can see this projection, we can see this is a very smooth thing. So we can know that this is the septum that we are seeing and this is the lateral wall. So in the lateral wall, which turbinate are we seeing here? Yes, this is the floor that we are seeing, floor of the nose. So this is the inferior turbinate and this is the middle turbinate. So what is this structure that is marked here? This is the inferior turbinate that is marked here. So yes, the answer here is inferior turbinate. Now let me show you a few endoscopic pictures and let me see whether you are able to identify what structures I am marking for you. Yes, so now when you see this picture, what I am going to mark is this structure. So can you tell me what the structure is? Can you tell me what the structure is? Is it the septum or is it the uh, lateral wall? Is it some turbinate that you are seeing? Yes, what we are seeing here is Yes, this is, this is appearing so clearly like a projection that is arising from the uh, lateral wall. So yes, this is the, again, this is the inferior turbinate and this is the septum. Again, the septum has a, a deviation that you are seeing in it, a deviation that you are seeing in it. So this is again a DNS that you are seeing and this is what is the inferior turbinate. Yes, now uh, look at this picture and identify this structure. Yes, so I am going to mark 1, 2, 3, 4 and you are quickly going to identify this structure. What is this here? Yes, the first thing you will see whether it is the septum or the lateral wall. So is it the septum or the lateral wall? Yes, this is the, we can see this is the projection appearing separate from uh, the, uh, from where it is arising, arising from uh, the wall. So that is the lateral wall. So what turbinate is this? This is the inferior turbinate. Tell me what this is. Yes, what is this? Yes, this is the septum. So this is the lateral wall. So this is the septum. 
Okay, so what is this structure here? Yeah, so this is the middle turbinate. Very good. So this is the middle turbinate. Okay, so now let us look at this uh, this endoscopic picture and you're going to quickly answer what the structures I'm mas uh, marking here. So what is this? Yes, we can see that this is some projection coming from the lateral wall. So this is the turbinate. Which turbinate is this? Yes, when we are raising it, what we are seeing in these structures. So what is this? Yes, this is the middle turbinate. Yes, quickly tell me what is this? Yes, this is the uncinate process. Very good. What is this? Yes, this is the bulge of, yes, the most common anti model cell, bulla ethmoidalis. What is this area? In between the bulla and the uncinate process, yes, this is the hiatus semilunaris, hiatus semilunaris. Yes, endoscopic pictures have been asked repeatedly in your exams. So, uh, yes, can you tell me what procedure is being done here? What procedure is being done here? Yes, we can see that this is some turbinate arising uh, from the lateral wall and Yes, this is the meatus. So what is this? This is the uncinate process. Uncinectomy, yes. What is the first step of S? Uncinectomy. Uncinate is a part of which bone? Ethmoid bone, yes. So again, CTs have been asked very, very commonly in your exam. So let us quickly see what the CT shows. Yes, uh, uh, can you tell me the star marked? What is this structure that is marked here? Yes, this is the repeated question. Yes, this is the ONOD cell. Yes, the ONOD cell. What is this arrow that is marked here? What is this here? Yes, this is the, this is the infundibulum, the infundibulum where the maxillary sinus opens. This is the infundibulum and uh, yes, that will be the uh, hiatus semilunaris in between the bulla and the uncinate process. Yes, so what is this? This is the uncinate process. What is this? Quickly tell me what is this? This is the bulla ethmoidalis. Very good. Now, last year was this question asked. In fact, I think, no, not last year. This was the AIMS question this year and was asked this structure. This structure was marked and was asked, what is this? What is this structure that is marked here? Which is, this is the uh, NTM most. In fact, it was none. The, only the picture was not given. The answer was given in the question itself. The NTM most NTA model cell has been marked here. And uh, uh, which one of the following is it? So the answer is given. The NTM most NTA model cell. Can you tell me what is that? Yes, the agar nasi. So this is the agar nasi. It is the NTA most NTA model cell. It is present just uh, even in front of the middle turbinate. That is the NTA most. Which is the largest uh, NTA model cell? Bull like modalis. Which is the infraorbital uh, NTA model cell? Yes, that is the ONOD cell that we just saw. And in the posterior model cell, which is the posterior model cell in relation to the sphenoid sinus? Yes, that is the ONOD cell. ONOD cell is in relation to which the important structures? Which the important structures can be damaged? Yes, the optic nerve and the internal carotid. And that is a repeated question. Repeated question. Yes. So we know that now. Yes, so here we are seeing some cell here. Now let me mark this and ask you what, what is this? What is this? Yes, is this important? This air cell, the big air cell that you're seeing, is this the bull -like modalis or is this the agar nasi? Yes, this is the anterior most anterior -like model cell and this is the agar nasi. How do you know that this is anterior most and this is not bull -like modalis? Just look at the maxillary sinuses. Yes, again we have done this. Uh, uh, clear, very, um, in detail in, in the, uh, in my, uh, YouTube. But I think that at this time before the exams, you will not have so much of time to do it in detail. Who have the time, you can go and visit and you can see it there. So this is the maxillary sinus. It is just appearing. So it is not yet appeared. So if we are seeing the maxillary sinus is not yet appeared and we are seeing the air cell, then what is that air cell? This is the agar nasi that we are seeing and this is the frontal sinuses. Okay, so uh, that is uh, what are being asked recently in your exams in the radiology of the nose and paranasal sinuses. So this was the other question. Identify the structure which does not form the laryngeal skeleton. Yes, a very, very simple question. This is what is A? Can you tell me? Yes, A is the epiglottis. So this is the epiglottis. B is, yes, this is the hyoid bone. C is the thyroid. And D is the cricoid. So which here is not a part of the larynx? Yes, the hyoid bone. Okay, so now uh, what extra is asked recently in the past 2-3 years, what extra has been asked in the framework of the larynx? Let us quickly see this. Yes, has been asked this membrane. So quickly, can you tell me what the membranes are? Yes, this is the hyoepiglottic membrane. This is the, yes, the thyrohyoid membrane. This is in between the cricoid and thyroid, cricothyroid membrane and this is the cricotracheal. Yes, so this is the cricotracheal and this is the cricothyroid. Okay, so what is asked is not the names of this membrane. What is asked is out of these, which is not an intrinsic membrane, which, sorry, which is not an extrinsic membrane, which is not an extrinsic membrane. Yes, so uh, hyoepiglottic, is it extrinsic? Yes. Thyrohyoid? Yes, which is not 
Yes, the cricotracheal. Why? Because it is connecting the two laryngeal cartilages with each other. It is not an extrinsic membrane. It is the anterior thickening of the uh, cricovocal membrane, which is the intrinsic membrane of the larynx. Okay. Now, another question that was asked, maybe this year or last year it was asked. And what was that was the... Uh, the opening here is shown here and it is asked what is this opening for can you tell me what this opening is for yes this is for the entry of yes the internal angel nerve the superior angel vessels and the internal angel nerve and again was a recent question asked that what is the landmark for anesthetizing the internal angel nerve landmark for anesthetizing the internal angel nerve so this is the nerve that is entering the internal angel nerve it is entering at the thyrohyoid membrane how do we anesthetize it what is the landmark? Yes, the landmark is the greater cornu of the hyoid. So, we just palpate the greater cornu of the hyoid and we inject the anesthetic just below it and that is, that will anesthetize this nerve internal angel nerve. Why do we want to anesthetize it? When do we want to anesthetize it? Yes, whenever we want to give uh, the, we want to anesthetize the, the upper part of the larynx, the supraglottis and the upper part of the hypopharynx is, sensation is given by this nerve. So, whenever we want to anesthetize that area to, for taking a biopsy, we need to anesthetize this nerve. And what if pathologically we have injured this nerve? That was again a question last year of AIM that while doing uh, surgery and uh, yes, again, that was a question of Jipmer also that while operating on the character triangle or while operating on uh, uh, the base of skull, patient has aspiration following surgery so if the patient has aspiration which means it means yes uh, uh, it means that yes the sensory branch definitely has gone and what is the sensory branch yes sensory branch of the supraglottis what is that that's the internal angel so if we are working at the carotid triangle area that is somewhere here lower down so then maybe we have just injured the superior angel nerve or we have just injured the internal angel nerve that can also uh, lead to a uh, little aspiration Yes, yeah, so if there is aspiration, it means that definitely the internal angel, the sensory is gone. So, okay, now let us see the next question here. Yes, the next question here is which of the following are objective tests of hearing? Yes, so objective, what is the meaning of objective test? Yes, what is the meaning of subjective test? Subjective means the subject, the patient has to cooperate in uh, getting the uh, result of the uh, test. Whereas objective test means that we do not need any cooperation from the side of the patient to do the test and to get the result of the test. Which means that uh, we can do the objective test whenever the uh, either the patient is not able to cooperate like for example when it is an infant, it is a child who does not know how to respond or if the patient is not mentally stable or if the patient is malingering then we can go for objective test. And better are the objective tests because the intelligence of the patient will not be, uh, will not be a hindrance in the result of the test. So now I am going to go first show you a few tests and you are going to tell me uh, two things. First, whether it is subjective or objective. And second, what is another thing that is asked in your exam is the picture is shown and it is asked that this test is for what? Yes. So, uh, the first picture you have is this. Yes. So this test. Yes, first name the test. What is this test? Yes, this is a pure tone audiometry. Yes, second thing, tell me whether this is a subjective or objective test. Yes, this is a subjective test. Only when the patient raises the hand and says that he is hearing or he has stopped hearing, only then we know that uh, the uh, we can mark it on the audiogram. So yes, this is a subjective test. This is a subjective test. And what does this test tell you? If you get an audiogram, what is in your mind that you get an audiogram, pure tone audiogram? Yes, when we want to know, Yes, when we want to confirm what hearing loss, whether it is a conductive, whether it is a sensorineural, we want to know exactly how much is the hearing loss, how much in decibel is the hearing loss, 10 decibel, 50 decibel, 60 decibel, 90 decibel, uh, what is the grade of hearing loss? That will, uh, we will come to know by the pure tone audiometry. So it will exactly tell us which frequency is affected, low frequency or high frequency. Okay, so these are the important things that we need to know here. Audiometry, audiogram are very, very commonly asked. Please see how to read the audiogram and revise it. Okay, so now tell me this test. Yes, very good. That's the very simple, the tuning fork test. Is it a subjective or objective test? Yes, again, the patient's cooperation is required. So this is a subjective test. And uh, uh, what the, when will you go for a tuning fork test? What does the tuning fork test tell you? Yes, whenever the patient has the hearing loss and uh, uh, you want to find out what it is, whether it is conductive or sensorineural or severe sensorineural. So it tells you about conductive or sensorineural or severe sensorineural hearing loss. Okay, so now uh, see this picture. What is this uh, test? Yes, first tell me the name of the test. 
what we are seeing is it is being done for an infant and uh, yes this is the autocaustic emission autocaustic emission subjective or objective yes the patient just lies down the child is sleeping we just put the probe and we give a sound whatever response occurs because of the activity of so this is another question auto autocaustic emission is produced from yes it is produced from the outer hair cells outer hair cells so the activity of the outer hair cells is recorded back by this uh, machine and it is uh, seen in the form of a graph here so this is an objective test so when do you do this test what does this test tell you tell me what does this test tell you does this test tell you about the functioning of the middle ear or the inner ear or the nerve what does it tell you yes it tells you about the outer hair cell function which means that it is uh, telling you about the uh, organ of corti yes but since the sound has to go through the middle ear and then the sound that we are recording back again has to come back through the middle ear and we are recording it if there is any pathology in the middle ear leading to a hearing loss of more than 35 decibel then maybe the sound is coming but we are not able to record it because because of the defect in the middle ear we are not it has got it is not able to pass so that is why whenever the autocaustic emission is absent don't think that it uh, always rule out that the middle ear is normal yes if the middle ear is normal and then the autocaustic emission emission is absent it indicates a pathology of the organ of corti so when do you do this test yes this test will tell you that the organ of corti is normal or it is not normal yes so if it is normal it means that uh, yes the child has a normal cochlea if it is abnormal then we uh, we can go for a better test and find out if actually the organ of corti is not functioning what help can we do for the child what can we do for the, for the child if the organ of corti is not functioning Yes, very good. We can go for a cochlear implant. Another question in cochlear implant that should it be done early? Yes or no? Yes, earliest at what age? One year. So, is there a role for screening hearing in neonates? Yes. And what's the best investigation for screening? That is autocaustic emission. Now, that was a question asked in your exams uh, two or three years back that if in autocaustic emission, the uh, result is a negative result when you, if you do not get the organ of corti is not functioning or the outer hair cells activity you have not got. What do you write the result as the test? Uh, result of the test. If it is present, you write as pass. But if it is absent, what do you write? Do you write a negative result? Do you write a fail or do you write a refer? Yes, yes. These were the choices that were given. Yes, we write as refer. We do not write as fail. Yes, because uh, imagine the uh, what the parents will feel if uh, the negative impact it will have on the parents when a child who is born, you are doing a test and you tell that your child has failed. Yes, so you write a refer. Why a refer? Refer for uh, the next investigation, the next better investigation, maybe a bera to be done to uh, find out exactly the cause of defect. So the best investigation for hearing loss in infants is not autocaustic emission, that is bera. Whereas the best for screening is in neonates is is autocaustic emission. Now, let me just add one question here, one um, uh, word here. Best investigation for screening hearing in neonates in ICU. In ICU. So, if it is a high risk, we do not want to go for uh, autocaustic emission. We want to go for the best test. And what is that best test? Yes, that is beta. So, these are the important things that have been asked recently in autocaustic emission. And uh, as like we saw this year, that uh, the questions that were asked were so many of them were the repeats that were asked so that is why it is very important that what are the important things in uh, the topics that have been asked in this exam. There is a high likelihood that these topics might be asked in the next exam. So we know each and everything of that particular topic. So yes, what is this test? Yes, first tell me the name of the test. Very good. This is Bera. Yes, is it a subjective or objective test? Subjective or objective? Yes, the child is sleeping. We uh, put the probe and we get the record in the form of waves. That is objective test. This is objective test. When do you do this? Yes, this tells you about the complete artery pathway. So, it is the best for uh, differentiating cochlear and retrocochlear. Yes, it tells you about the artery pathway completely. So, for best for retrocochlear hearing loss. Give me an example of retrocochlear hearing loss. Yes, or acoustic neuroma. This is the best audiometric test for acoustic neuroma. So, now mind, mind this. This is the best audiometric test. When it is given in the exam, best investigation for acoustic neuroma, always this is the first choice, Bera. And what you do is, okay, acoustic neuroma, and you see Bera, and yes, you, you're very happy you mark the answer as the first choice. No, the best investigation for an intracranial tumor like acoustic neuroma is a MRI, is a gadolinium enhanced MRI. The best audiometric test is Bera. 
so uh, and yes this is the best for uh, uh, best for finding out hearing loss in neonates best for malingerers so this is a very very important very commonly asked test yes so now uh, what is this test that you are seeing Yes, we can see some instrument here and we are seeing some uh, graph to have a closer look at the instrument and the graph. Yes, so you are having a closer look at the instrument. We are seeing there is a probe here. There is the instrument through which some uh, report is coming out. So what is this? What is this test? Yes, this is how tympanometry is done. So is tympanometry objective or is a subjective test? So this is tympanometry. Is this a subjective or objective test? Yes, we can see just a probe is put, a sound is given and the record is is uh, we get in the form of a graph so it is a very quick test this is a objective test yes so now tell me uh, when will you do this test what's the use for tympanometry yes when we want to find out the condition of middle ear inner ear or the nerve when do you do this tympanometry yes it will tell you about the condition of yes the middle ear that was a question that was asked uh, recently in your exam that what is the test to find out the condition of middle ear with a normal looking intact tympanic membrane. Yes, that is tympanometry. There was another question again, that was a question of AIMS and that was that what is the um, best, what is the most reliable test for eustachian tube function? Yes, that is again tympanometry and the same year, the same question was asked in NEAT also that the most reliable test for eustachian tube function is Yes, that is again tympanometry. So we know that this is a test for middle ear function. This is, uh, this has to be done when the tympanic membrane is intact, normal looking. And when, uh, this will also test, test the eustachian tube, the various graphs of the tympanometry. We already know you can revise that. And yes, this is a, uh, object, this is a objective test. And this, another thing that tells you, uh, this test tells you is also the stepedial reflex. So very, very important you need to know is that this will also tell you about the stepedial reflex. Stepedial reflex, that is a very important objective test. This is done, this is, uh, uh the, in the same graph, we get the stepedial reflex and the tympanometric curve. So, uh, together that is what is known as impedance audiometry. Okay, so now, uh, yes, can you see this? This is again the tympanometry. Nowadays it is done with a very easy handheld device. Just it is put into the external optic canal and the pressure changes is done and you get the record in the form of a graph. Yes, this device looks something like this. So yes, this is also, if this device is given, know that what is given is the tympanometry. Okay, so now can you tell me what is this test that we are seeing here? What is this uh, uh, audiometric test? Yes, uh, uh, you are seeing that some probe is passed through the tympanic membrane to rest on the promontory to rest on the promontory and also we are seeing some graph here and what in the graph we can see is action potential AP and we can see what is mentioned is SP so the SP and AP also tells you what uh, this is yes can you tell me this is a quick revision for you tell me yes yes this is electrocochleography electrocochleography yes it is a subjective or objective test this is objective test and this is not only objective this is an invasive test you have to pass the probe through the tympanic membrane to rest on the promontory it can also be done by keeping the probe uh, outside the tympanic membrane very close to the tympanic membrane but the result is more robust the uh, graph that you get is better when you pass it through the tympanic membrane to rest on the promontory when is this done Tell me the indication of this test. Electrocochleography, measuring the electrical activity of the cochlea. Yes, this is the best investigation for that disease of the cochlea. Yes, very common in your exams, as in your exams, is the menia. So, this is the best investigation for menias. So, this is now, let us answer this question. Which are the objective tests? So, Bera, is it objective? Yes, it is objective. Autocaustic emission? Yes. Pure tone audiometry? No, this is subjective. Tympanometry? Yes, it is objective. So, A, B and D. Where is that? A, B and D. Yes, so this is the option. So, next is identify the correct sequence of artery pathway. So, artery pathway sequence. What is the artery pathway? Yes, so here we have the artery pathway in front of us. And yes, we know the sound enters from the external ear into the middle ear and then it reaches the cochlea. Now, once it has reached the cochlea, then it is picked up by the nerves. So, here it is asked, it was asked, the question that was asked was, what is the neurotransmitter that is released from the uh, inner hair cells which is which stimulates the nerves? Yes, which is a neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter all over the CNS. What is that? Yes, that is the glutamate. Okay, so uh, what are the parts of the artery pathway? Again, this is a repeat question. This question was asked uh, in AIMS last year. Yes, so this is, or first is the from the artery nerve. It goes to the brainstem to the nuclear of the, uh, of the, co of the cochlear, uh, cochlear nerve that is a cochlear nuclei. And then from the cochlear nuclei, the next part is the superior olivary complex. The third is the superior olivary complex. And at this level, uh, 
uh, the uh, the uh, the transmission of sound from one ear to the other occurs and then is what is a mnemonic what did we learn as a mnemonic yes it is slim s l i m what is s s is superior olivary complex l is the double l lateral lemniscus i is the inferior colliculus and m is the medial geniculate body s are the thalamus we have the medial geniculate body Ultimately, appreciation of sound occurs in artery cortex. Yes, so artery cortex area number 41. So, let us see what are the other questions that are asked in the artery pathway recently in your exam. Yes, first has been asked that at the level of the inner hair cells, what is the neurotransmitter? Yes, we know that that is glutamate. Second, at what level in the artery pathway main transmission from one side to the other occurs? Yes, that is the interconnection occurs at which which site mainly? Yes, that is at the superior olivary complex. So, this is another important question that is asked. The other important question that is asked and that was again a recent question that the superior olivary complex is only the interconnection from the opposite side artery pathway or there is some other interconnection. This was not the question. I will tell you the question. You tell me. Is there some other interconnection? Is the interconnection of the 8th nerve with the 7th nerve also? Yes, and that is at the level of the superior olivary complex with the 7th nerve. And why is the 8th nerve and the 7th nerve interconnected? 8th nerve and the 7th nerve? Yes, to for the mediation of the superior reflex, a loud sound comes, the afferent is the 8th nerve, efferent is the 7th nerve. So, at the level of superior olivary complex, the uh, sensing occurs that there is a very loud sound. It can damage the inner ear. And from here, from the superior olivary complex, the seventh nerve of both the ears is stimulated, leading to contraction of the superior muscle, leading to superior reflex, protecting the inner ear from noise trauma. So, the, what was the question that was asked? What is the center for superior reflex in the artery pathway? So, what is the center for superior reflex? Yes, it is the superior olivary complex. Okay, and uh, uh, what extra? Yes, lateral lemniscus. What is asked in lateral lemniscus? A repeated question. Yes, all these parts of the artery pathway can be measured by the test, which is Bera. Yes, so in Bera is asked, which is the most prominent wave of Bera, which is the largest wave of Bera. Yes, the largest wave is the double L, double L for largest. That is lateral lemniscus. So, what is the largest wave of Bera? Yes, the largest wave is the double L that is produced by lateral lemniscus. This is a repeated question. In fact, five, six times consecutively was this question asked uh, in your exams. Largest wave of Bera is the wave 5 and wave 5 stands for lateral lemniscus. Okay, so what is the other question that is asked here? The appreciation of sound occurs at which level? Yes, the appreciation of sound when we actually perceive the sound. We uh, not only hear it, we perceive it, we understand it. That occurs at the level of the artery cortex, area number 41. And this is a part of superior temporal gyrus. Superior temporal gyrus. So, these are the other things in the artery pathway that are asked. Yes, and another important thing that this transmission that occurs at the superior olivary complex and the sound is going from one ear, it is picked up, it is going to the other ear also, which means that we perceive any sound that is coming from one ear, we perceive it from both the cerebral hemispheres. So, uh, how do we know whether the sound is coming from this side or from this side? In other words, how do we localize the sound? Yes, that occurs because of the difference in the time it reaches that particular artery pathway and also difference in the intensity. A sound that is coming from this side will be louder in this, this year as compared to when it is transmitted to the other year. So, this difference in the time and this difference in uh, the, uh, the time and the intensity of sound will localize the sound and the localization of the sound is the very, very, very important function of the artery pathway. Yes, that is another question that is asked. Artery pathway has a very important function of localization of sound. And this localization occurs throughout the artery pathway and starts at which level? Starts at which level? Again, the superior olivary complex. The superior olivary complex is the starting of the localization of sound. It is also the site of the uh, transverse pathways of interconnection of the artery pathway, the major part. And it is also the site for the center for stepedial reflex. Center for stepedial reflex. So, these are the important things that questions that have been asked recently from the artery pathway. Okay, so now, uh, uh, can you tell the correct sequence of the artery pathway? Yes, the f let us read and first let us mark which will come first, second, third, fourth and then we can see. Yes, so yes, cochlear nucleus. First is the cochlear nucleus. Uh, then it is, after the cochlear nuclei, it is slim, S-L-I-M. Yes, so superior olivary complex. Then is L, lateral lemniscus. And then is I, that is inferior colliculus. And then is uh, M, medial geniculate body. So, it will be B, then A, then D, bad. Okay, and then C, 
and then E. Okay, so bad CE. What is that? B bad CE. Yes, yeah, so this is this one. So this is the answer here. So yes. Now this is one question. Identify the mark for a man. And you must be thinking, why at all are we doing it in ENT? This is a question of the of anatomy. Yes, I stole it from anatomy for you. And uh, yes, why? Because I think that how much we have read, what all we have read in the uh, in uh, in in the uh, nose nerve supply will help you solve this question even if you exactly from anatomy do not remember that what this is so we can see and we can find out which bone is this yes this is the uh, uh, sphenoid bone that we are seeing and two foramen we can see here this is one foramen the other and one is marked the lateral one is marked okay so first tell me this is the sphenoid bone okay this is the sphenoid bone this is the lesser wing we are seeing. This is the greater wing. What is this that you are seeing? What is this? Yes, we have read about this, this, this structure so many times in ENT. Yes, in the nose. What is that? Yes, that is the pterygoid plate. Yes, what is the area in front of the pterygoid plate known as? I will give you a choice. Is the area in front of the pterygoid plates known as the sphenopalatine fossa? Yes or no? Yes or no? True, false? True. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, we have this here is the, uh, this here is the skin of the cheek. This is the cheek. We have the maxillary sinus anterior wall. We have the cavity of the maxillary sinus here. We have the posterior wall of maxillary sinus. And here posteriorly we have the pterygoid plate. And this area that we are seeing in between the maxillary sinus and the pterygoid plate. In other words, anterior to the pterygoid plate, this is the sphenopalatine fossa. Yes or no? Yes. Can you tell me the contents of sphenopalatine fossa? Contents of sphenopalatine fossa. Yes, we have the maxillary artery. We have the maxillary nerve. And we also have the largest parasympathetic ganglion. Which one was that? Yes, the sphenopalatine ganglion. And this is the parasympathetic ganglion. Which is the parasympathetic nerve here? Yes, that is the median nerve. That is the median nerve. Which means that two nerves will be entering into the sphenopalatine fossa. And one artery enters the sphenopalatine fossa. Artery comes from where? Yes, artery comes from here. This area that we are seeing. This area, all this area, yes, this area, all this area, this is the infratemporal fossa that is lateral to the maxillary sinus and below this uh, skin of the cheek that is the infratemporal fossa. Here we have the temporal fossa. So we know that the external carotid goes from here from the neck into the infratemporal fossa. Here it gives the branch the maxillary and that from the infratemporal fossa it enters into the into the sphenopalatine fossa. So, which means that if something is coming from uh, posteriorly from the base of skull area from the body of the sphenoid, it means piercing the sphenoid, it has to be these two nerves, either the maxillary nerve or the median nerve. Yes. So, yes, it can be either the maxillary nerve. We can see here, it can be either the maxillary or the median nerve. So, what we are seeing here is the sphenoid bone. This is the sphenoid sinuses in the sphenoid bone. We are seeing the opening of the sphenoid sinus here. Yes, this is the lesser wing. This is the superior orbital fissure. This is the pterygoid plate. So we have two foramen here. One is this, one is lateral. So yes, we know that the foramen rotundum is the maxillary nerve will come into the sphenopalatine fossa. It exits the brain through, exits the cranium through the foramen rotundum. So the foramen rotundum will, uh, so yes, this comes through the foramen rotundum and the median nerve comes through the pterygoid canal. We know that, right? We, pterygoid canal. Where is the pterygoid canal? The pterygoid canal is present at the root of the pterygoid, from here is the opening and it enters like this, yes, at the root of the pterygoid, which means that this foramen here at the root of the pterygoid, that is going to be the pterygoid canal, the median nerve canal, whereas the one that we are seeing in the greater wing of the sphen uh, greater wing of the sphenoid, here starts the greater wing. So, greater wing of sphenoid, that is the foramen rotundum. And now, if this artery, if I mark uh, this, this structure and I ask you, what is this artery? Yeah, so, this artery is going anterior to the pterygoid plate, which means that this artery is going in which area? The sphenopalatine fossa. Which, art which artery is this? Yes, this is the maxillary artery. So, yes, this is the foramen rotundum and just below the foramen rotundum. Uh, now, when you read your books, you have, when, whenever you have read about the maxillary nerve also, you have already, all, always read that it exits through the foramen rotundum directly into the sphenopalatine fossa. So, when we see the lower part, it appears like this. When we see it, the sphenoid bone, it appears like this. This is the foramen rotundum in the greater wing of the sphenoid. So, uh, I thought that even if by seeing the picture, this is something that you can correlate. But yes, for that, your concept has to be very clear. And uh, uh, you, 
because the time is very limited in the exams. So it is very, very important that the moment you see something, it immediately reminds you of what you've already read about that part. Even when you're learning, always correlate, try to correlate and learn. Okay, so we have one question. This is from my side and that is from the COVID. We had so many COVID questions. The following can be the presenting symptoms of COVID-19. Yes, so COVID-19, the sore throat, cough, yes. Fever, yes, anosmia and agusia. So yes, the sore throat, uh, anosmia, agusia. Or what is anosmia? Yes, loss of smell. Agusia is loss of taste. All these are features of COVID, the presenting features of COVID-19. And uh, yes, this is uh, uh, now that the patients uh, come with these complaints and they tell that they, they had never realized that the smell sense is so, so important. They are not able to, the, uh, the loss of taste is because of two reasons here because of the loss of taste per se and also because of the loss of smell. Smell adds flavor to the food. So if that is gone, the taste the, of the food is not uh, perceived. It appears as tasteless. Yes, they are not able to um, uh, sense that whatever they are cooking is just burning out. They are not able to uh, sense the, uh, if there is some dirt, they are not able to find out that that area is a dirty area. They should not go. So all these uh, uh, functions of the smell is now when they have lost it, they are uh, uh, now uh, re realizing that how important the uh, sense of smell is. And uh, yes, one of the students also messaged me that I have lost smell and it's been now three months and I thought it will recover, but it is not and my life is really becoming hell. I did not know that smell was so important. So yes, the uh, anosmia and aguesia. So what to do about it? What to do? How does it uh, manifest in COVID patients? Yes, usually it recovers. It recovers in three to four days and um, a maximum if it has to recover, it recovers in two weeks. In two weeks time, uh, so usually in two weeks time, we do not need to give something, anything additional for the management of the anosmia in these patients. But if in two weeks time, there has been no recovery of the smell, then we think of giving the management. So what is the management that we give here? is we give the uh, local steroids local steroids the systemic steroids we are not preferring here in uh, uh, to give because for loss of smell for loss of smell yes local steroids uh, are given are given and also what is given is the olfactory training what is olfactory training olfactory training is the patient is asked to smell uh, some uh, things which have got a very um, nice uh, um, a nice uh, smell and a strong smell for example like rose lemon uh, cloves, eucalyptus. So the patient is asked to smell these things 20 seconds, three times in a day for three months. So that is what is known as olfactory training that helps to, um, for the uh, regeneration of the nerves. So that is how we manage anosmia and in patients of COVID-19. So this is what is the very, very important, very, very commonly seen uh, symptom. And what is the answer here? Yes, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, all are seen. Okay, so now uh, these were the questions and uh, we have quickly done all the important things that uh, likely might be there in uh, NEAT PG also. So now you must be thinking that when is NEAT? Yes, we are waiting for it. Yes, so as I told you in the beginning also that you need to do two important things. You need to believe in yourself. You need to believe in yourself, in your dreams and you need to believe that what you have is this day today. Use it to the fullest. Use it to the fullest and Change this uncertainty into an opportunity. You might, might be feeling that it is uh, uh, maybe three months, four months. It is it is nothing. Time just flies. And uh, uh, previously, whenever we used to have the exams, and now also we have the AIMS, we have PGI, and after that we have the NEET. Previously, previous to NEET, what we used to have was All India. So we had the All India and after All India, after a month or um, one and a half months, we used to have the state PG exam. So why do you think that the this exam has been postponed and what should I do now? What do you have to do? You have to prepare uh, as if the exam, the NEET exam is on the 10th of January itself. You do not have to think it has got postponed and the next, whenever it is actually, by the time uh, uh, you uh, you complete your revision, thinking that your exam is by the, uh, is on the same date, the dates will be announced. And you can consider that as the next exam and that as the more important exam and prepare for it like you would have prepared if NEET was not there, if uh, you had All India and you had another exam. 
is that is what you always do you uh, prepare for aims and then uh, do you lose all your energy and you do not prepare for need anymore yes you prepare you prepare you know that where you have made a mistake you know uh, what all you need uh, uh, more revision and so accordingly you you prepare for uh, your uh, uh, need considering that it's the same date and then you think that there is another exam a more important exam more which you need to revise so how do we need to revise yes you uh, uh, already must be having so many ideas in your mind so i'm not going to give you some uh, separate plan the plan you can make out yourself what i need to tell you is that yes uh, the uh, the revision is very very important and how should be the revision students ask me that the revision that we do should we just read the notes or should we just do the mcqs both is very important giving the test is very very important giving the grand test is very important and that that uh, um, any test that you are giving don't think that it is not the final test give it as if this was the final test so do the proper revision before giving every grand test and uh, give a grand test almost uh, at least a week uh, in a week give at least one grand test with proper full revision and uh, whatever grand test result is coming it is not just for giving the test and and seeing it is for improving so wherever you are making a mistake note down those uh, areas go back and read that in depth why you are making a mistake there do as many mcqs as possible and for the revision what uh, uh, the way i like to revise and the way i like to read is what you yes that i can share with you and what you can also do is whenever you are reading any surgical branch so you are raising reading any topic of the uh, surgery for example you are uh, reading the stomach so you can quickly in the anatomy you can see what to all in the anatomy of the stomach was important what were the important questions that were asked there and then you can come to the surgical part and uh, see uh, and integrate it in this way and you will find that there are so many correlations so many things which are integrated and since the exam now is integrated that is definitely going to help you if you are doing uh, the diseases of the heart in medicine you can first quickly do the anatomy of the heart and see what all arteries what all vessels are important there so um, uh, which which area of the heart is supplied by which vessel what are the important things of the heart the physiology how the functioning what are the important uh, things in physiology of the heart that is important in an hours in your exam then you can come to the diseases and then you can go to the pharma you can go you can go to the cardiac part of the pharma and see that which uh, the drugs we are using in which disease so you can go for an integrated approach and that definitely helps you because uh, many of the questions that are asked uh, combine everything and uh, there will be many overlaps so that will help you to quickly finish uh, um, all the subjects together because if you read the same question same subject again and again the whole day you might get bored give yourself uh, uh, always in the morning or maybe a night before always make the plan for the next day and give yourself enough breaks Give the rest proper rest is very important proper intake is very important whatever you are going to do is going to, you are going to do through this body so this has to be proper functional so give it proper rest give it proper food give it exercise yes don't uh, uh, can keep your phone and uh, all that media i know you are so intelligent you are not doing all that but yes um, don't do all that uh, at all just be uh, out of the social media and just concentrate uh, on what you have to do that particular day if you have finished that particular day you are successful for that particular day you will be overall uh, ultimately successful for all the people who have started late yes uh, uh, one thing that the mistake that uh, uh, students do and they tell us that we prepared for neat uh, we knew that we have started late so we were very late but we thought that we let us give so we just did the mcqs and we just certified and now uh, uh, we have another exam now again we are with cet or aims and again we have limited time left so do not uh, just whatever whatever you are reading if you have letter time also if you are preparing for uh, the neat exam and you have uh, two or three months with you whatever you are reading in that two or three months let it be the very important topics and those topics that you are doing let it be for once and for all finish it completely don't just uh, uh, ratify and just don't waste this time this knowledge has to be of use for you for the next exam that you are going to give make that idea your life dream about it think about it 
and make it your life make let your muscles your nerves your brain and more importantly your heart be immersed in that idea and that is the only way of success so uh all the best we are always here with you in maro to help you out anywhere you need us please reach out to us all the best